Welcome back to season five of Serious and Silly with Scott and Sheila. Sheila is off this week, but filling in is our wonderful social worker, Booney T. Booney, welcome. Hi, thanks, Scott. Booney, one in three. That is the number of women that will face some sort of physical or sexual abuse in their lifetime. One in four for CJEP age students. Mm -hmm. Today's guest is a true hero. Um, she is sharing her story through her work with Major League Baseball and locally with the group Women Aware. She is literally saving lives by sharing her story, letting people know what she went through in hopes that they don't have the same fate. So we're really, really thankful that she's joining us. Her name is Amy Kaufman. We welcome her to Champlain College. Amy, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so appreciated. It's such an important topic and you and Booney are just perfect for this. So I'm going to turn it over to Booney. Okay, great. Thanks, Scott. What a setup. All right. So Amy, uh, I also want to reiterate what Scott just said. Uh, I know it takes a lot of courage to all, you know, to always retell your story as well. It's very difficult. It's emotionally draining. Um, in terms of my work with the students in mental health, in sexual violence prevention and support, uh, I know it's it can be re-triggering, it's re-traumatizing, but I you do it not just for yourself, but you know, so selflessly just for the community, for other women and other people out there who are experiencing intimate partner violence, sexual violence, any kind of a form of abuse, emotional, financial, physical. So this is not gonna be as you know, silly as most of got serious and silly's conversation, but uh, I know it's super important that we're here today to talk about it. So we'll just jump right in. Basically, Amy, why do you think it's um, important for you to be here today and speak out about what happened to you? I mean, as you were saying, one in four CJEP students, which is who's listening, hopefully right now. Um, and I think it's a lot more common than that. That's who reports it. Um, and based on the one in three Statistics, it means that whoever's listening to this knows someone who is going through this and whether it's them themselves or someone else, representation really matters and these things um, stay secret and continue to happen uh, when people keep quiet about them. And yes, it's really hard to, or it was at least in the beginning to speak about my story, but I've found it empowering um, to speak about my story and to represent people who don't have the same opportunity to speak out about the dynamics and what leads to this, uh, these types of situation and prevention is extremely important. Uh, I, again, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, conjugal violence. And um, while going through it, I at one point Googled like famous people who have opened up about conjugal violence and found like one or two people that were not relatable in any way. Um, and just looking to feel like you're not the only person and clearly based on statistics and data, you're not the only person, but it does help to hear someone else talking about it and realize that it's not, you know, it wasn't because I was stupid that I ended up in this situation or because I didn't leave it the moment it became abusive. Um, these things happen for a reason and one in three people go th through this uh, not because one in three people is stupid or makes poor choices. So, No, exactly. I mean, what you're saying right there is that anybody can be in this situation, right? Whether you're wealthy, not wealthy, whatever color you are, whatever race you come from, community you come from, it just happens. And so letting your story be heard, you're showing that someone like me, can. it can also happen to myself. And so... Yeah, but I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you're finding strength in talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. I know that takes time and not everybody will feel the same way as you. Yeah. Um, many people, like you said, they will never talk about it. They won't mention it. That's why it's so underreported, right? So right. I mean, my situation was a bit unique in that the person who was abusive towards me, my ex-husband was somewhat well known in the sports writing world. And so this was all made public without my consent, not my name. Uh, but enough people knew um, who I was uh, from being in similar circles with him. And this trended on Twitter. And so it had been prior to my speaking um, with CBC and with the LA Times, um, when you Googled my name, it just came up that I was a victim, which was not what I wanted to be um, the definitive experience that I had gone through because I 
well, yes, I at one point was a victim of conjugal violence. That's not any longer how I feel. And there is power in using certain words like survivor instead of victim. And that's very much how I feel. And I think it's also important to show that like there can be a positive outcome and mm -hmm. my life is good and I'm okay. And in large part, that's to do with certain privilege uh, that I had support and a network of people to help me get out of the situation. But it doesn't have to define your life. No. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that you did not choose to be named as the victim back then, but now as a survivor, you're taking control of your narrative. Exactly. So it's very important that you do that for yourself, for your well-being, for you to move forward, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And every time I have come out, I hear from so many people, male, female, transgender, non-binary people who come forward to speak about their own experiences or about the experiences of one of their parents or one of their friends. And it's startling how common this is. Um, and it's an awful situation to find so many people in. Um, but these are really dynamic, intelligent people who have just found themselves in situations that are really hard to get out of. Yeah. So I'm just going back to when we first met last week and you mentioned that, you know, we talked about how we're on this funny, serious web series, but this topic, the subject is very uncomfortable. So, and you said it's really important that people are uncomfortable when they talk about it. Can you tell us what you meant by that? I mean, I think as people, it's really easy to want to remain comfortable. Um, and when you're not the person going through the situation, like prime 38 years old, prior to my being 34 or 35, I had no experience like this and had been in healthy relationships that didn't work out and where, you know, there had been fighting and people that were overall pretty great. Um, and this was a subject that would have made me extremely uncomfortable. I would have been, you know, questioning, well, why did this person stay in this relationship? And I would never find myself in this situation, um, which of course, came back to haunt me, but it's really easy to think that you could never find yourself in this situation. And it's uncomfortable for people to feel that they could, or to try to put themselves in the shoes of someone who they don't want to be in shoes. It's sort of there are certain topics that just as a society we're uncomfortable with. This has gone on forever. This is not changing. This is not showing signs of stopping. Um, intimate partner violence is a massive problem that uh, like during COVID is, was its own, they call it the shadow pandemic because this was going on so rampantly uh, during COVID, which means that it had been going on before as well. People were just stuck um, at home together. But the only way it's gonna change is if people become uncomfortable. The situation I was in because my ex was somewhat well known um, and this happened at the right time and he was cancelable. He's not Trevor Bauer. He was not, you know, he didn't play for the Yankees. He was not, I guess he was replaceable in the sports writing world. And so he was canceled immediately. As soon as this came out, he lost all of his jobs. He was canceled. Nobody associated with him publicly. Um, and as much as people, you know, can speak about the negatives of cancel culture, I think it's also just society deciding that maybe there should be consequences for our actions. Um, and it was empowering for me to feel that people did take my side. Um, I remember being told not to look on Twitter because there might be bad things written about me and a friend of mine doing so and calling me to be like, there's not one comment that's anything other than supportive oh, wow. of you. Um, and so even if being uncomfortable makes it so that we're less likely to make a comment like, well, I would never stay or what was wrong with her or when it comes to, you know, a situation like Deshaun Watt, uh, Watson in the NFL to not make it so that that person is so talented that there's a different threshold for what we'll accept from them. Um, and if, you know, athletes, you know, student athletes are listening to this, the conversations you have in the locker room, um, do you don't know who's listening. You don't know who males can be abused as well. You don't know who's in an abusive relationship. You don't know who's an abuser, who's watching their mom being abused, whatever the dynamic may be. But those little comments, when you hear them and you're in this situation, are make it a lot harder to want to leave. One of the great things, so many great things that you brought up, Amy, but one of the reasons we really wanted to have you is immediately you told us that there's no questions, you know, that we can't ask. So speaking of uncomfortability, one of the things that obviously a lot of people think about, myself included, is, you know, we have this well-educated, you know, 
person in front of us, like why people want to know, why didn't you just leave? This is something that's a common question, probably one of your most common questions. Yeah, it is one of the most common questions. And it's one that I'm comfortable with because again, it was one that I asked um, about other people, at least mm -hmm. in my head when these things came up, it is, it's an appropriate question for this interview. It's not an appropriate question for someone who is going through it. You know, I, had people once I left say things to like, well, how could you have stayed? And I don't understand. And the onus is not on survivors um, to spot signs and warning signs. And these things don't happen in a vacuum. It's not as though you're dating for three weeks and the person is suddenly abusive and you're like, well, I'm going to just go with this. Um, coercive control plays a really big part in all of this. Abuse takes many forms and these things often start out um, you know, it starts off as a whirlwind. You suddenly feel seen by somebody who's making these romantic overtures and putting you on a pedestal. And it seems a lot like a romantic movie, which you prior to then didn't ever think was possible. And things like, oh, are they going to text me? Are they going to call me? Are not questions you have to ask because they do incessant incessantly. Um, some people talk about, like, I had a feeling of like, this may be too much and I'm, you know, something might be a little off, but not everybody has that sense. Um, in this case, it was wonderful and perfect and amazing and went very, very quickly, which is really common. And we moved in together very quickly. Um, he wanted me to be his podcast producer very quickly. So we were working together. I was financially dependent on him. Um, Things like financial control often happen, whether it's even a CJEP relationship where it's like, well, you know, it stresses you out to have a bank account. So why don't we share mine and you can put your paycheck in here. Um, there are examples, especially in younger people of, you know, here, I'm going to take the bus with you to your job so we can spend more time together so that they know exactly where you are. They may want you to be on the phone less with your friends. Um, people who are really supportive in your life may suddenly be subject to their judgment and oftentimes things are so good that you will isolate yourself, um, you know, not answer your friends' calls, not be as reliable with people, maybe stop working as hard at school, things like that. And your friends may call you out on it and raise questions about the, your partner. You become defensive. It's sort of like a, a perfect mixture for once things start to go wrong slowly and you start to realize something's wrong, you don't really want to have been wrong. You don't want to lose all of the good things that have gone on between you. Uh, you don't know how you can function without this person. Um, and this person has done this on purpose to you, which is important to realize. In my case, we work together, live together, and I was pregnant um, and very much felt in danger for my life. That's It's not always the case that people, you know, aren't leaving because they feel that they're in danger. I didn't realize the extent to which I was in danger. Um, thinking, well, he would never really hurt me. He would never, you know, try to kill me. You, the goalpost continually moves. And upon being strangled, I realized that now my chances of being murdered by him had increased by 700%, which was not something that I felt comfortable with, but again, had the ability to um, have my best friend called my brother who called the police and that was the end of it. And I never, I've never seen my ex-husband again. We didn't even have to be in the same courtroom um, okay. and he's currently in prison. But again, I had privilege. Um, I am an educated white cisgender woman, which should not make any difference whatsoever. Um, and it can. And so wanting to speak to young people, uh, both about prevention, um, and a lot of them are unfortunately in this situation, but also there's a system that's broken and we need people to, you know, want to be public defenders and want to be police officers who understand these nuanced issues and understand that they could happen to anyone so that things can be a little more fair and that everybody can have the same opportunity to get out of their relationships. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, you covered so much already in that response to Scott's question, Amy, from, you know, potential signs of abuse in a relationship to, um, you know, letting us know when you decide to leave because you were in actual fear of being killed, right? And as we know already, just like in this year, there's already been six or seven femicides. Last year was, what, 26? And, and that was the highest number in Quebec so far. Yeah, I mean, we're only seeing the numbers increasing. So it's it's for people who are listening and watching, it's a very real problem. And it starts, like you said, Amy, very slowly, very 
um, romantically even, right? Just get being caught up, swept up by um, those overtures and, um, you know, being wanting to be with you all the time and making sure that you are looked after or, you know, under those premises, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as we know, it is forms of control. So, um, but they're very subtle, subtle and then you kind of, can you you feel confused? You feel gaslit, right? I, I it's very yeah. It's very destabilizing to go from being the best person in the world to the worst person in the world and not understanding what it is. Um, people like instead of walking on eggshells, you feel like you're walking on landmines, and that destabilizing force and being told that you're crazy and that didn't really happen mm -hmm. and I didn't say that and what are you talking about? Um, or you've made me do this and I've never done this before and you've brought this out in me is so destabilizing that you are stuck living moment to moment. And it's very difficult when people talk about why don't you leave? It's very difficult to be planning what you're going to be doing in three days from now when you're walking on fire. Um, you really have to be present, you have to be aware and you're trying everything possible to stay sane. Um, and again, whether it's physical or verbal, um, emotional and verbal abuse, is just as destabilizing and is often complicated by the fact that you're not sure whether this is abuse or if this is a bad temper. Um, and reading and educating yourself about abuse um, and the forms in which it takes can often be a really important part of realizing that it in fact is. Right, yeah, I think in terms of what you experience as a survivor, you know, it kind of covered a lot of forms of violence. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, many students that I work with at the CGIP level, um, I haven't heard so much of the physical yet. There are cases, obviously, um, cases of physical abuse and sexual abuse, for sure. We've seen them and they've been through our offices, but more predominantly, it's more um, emotional abuse, psychological control, cutting them off from friends and family. It's very, very vital in those kinds of controlling relationships. So it's kind of working to get students to understand that form of um, abuse and validating that it's not okay and that, um, you know, maybe uh, they could find support somehow to leave, right? If they, they're ready to, you know? And like you said, you were in a situation where you were pregnant and just starting a new family, you know? And that must have been very, very difficult for you to actually even think about being on your own with this baby, right? Uh, it wasn't as much as being on my own with the baby. Um, it was having to share a baby with someone who oh, you yeah. know. Okay, baby. definitely. And often when it comes about. to um, people who might have to co-parent with the person, that's often the biggest challenge. Um, I'm very lucky that that's not what I have to do. Um, mm -hmm. But it's difficult to imagine placing yourself of you know, fleeing to safety and your child being stuck. Um, okay which is also, you know, a part of this process is often that, you know, the person may want to have unprotected sex when you're not comfortable with it, um, which is another way for the use of course of control. You may, you might end up pregnant. You may end up talked into having a baby with someone, which will make it a lot more difficult um, to leave. And these not respecting of your boundaries are giant red flags um, and course of control and emotional abuse it doesn't get better. People that are behaving in this way and that are purposely trying to control you aren't going to change, but it may get worse. Um, often ab physical abuse started as emotional abuse. So, yeah. Amy, you mentioned, you, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Scott, go ahead. Amy, because you just mentioned a few times, and this is a term that when, you know, researching you, I learned for the first time, would you tell us a little bit about co coercive control for people like me who may not be familiar? Yeah, coercive control is a lot more covert, um, so it's harder to spot. It has started to become something that the law recognizes as well, um, but that taking control of someone, financial control, limiting who they speak to, um, sort of using psychological tactics to control someone, make them sort of too afraid to stand up to you, to say, you know what, I am going to go out with my friends, going with them everywhere that they go. The example of, you know, taking them to work all of the time, taking on their finances, um, bringing up issues with their fit, with their family that they may not, not have seen prior to that, um, ending up in a situation where leaving that person isn't extremely complicated. 
Um, and that's often how these things take form in c shops in high schools. Um, people who've not been in relationships before and may not understand the healthy boundaries that you're supposed to have and that it's not supposed to be a symbiotic process between two people. Um, and it can really quickly escalate into physical abuse and into a situation that can be very dangerous to get out of. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if many of your students who are in serious relationships could relate to a lot of these things. I mean, that's a great segue to our next question because, you know, if the students that come through, sometimes they understand the kind of relationships they're in, sometimes they're not even aware, right? Um, and for those, like I said, who might feel, uh, you know, rel like this, this conversation is relevant to their situation at the moment, what would you advise them to do? How would you advise them to get support or reach out? I mean, there are many, many organizations in Montreal um, that can help with these types of things. I believe that that's something that you guys are there for as well within school um, and having access to social worker, to counselors, to people who are trauma informed, um, make use of it. Because once you're not in school, it's not as easy to find people um, who are trauma informed and who will walk you through the appropriate steps and give you support without judgment that's confidential um, and send you to the right resources. But certainly educating yourself about what just what abuse looks like um, can make you can be really grounding and make you feel a lot less crazy. Um, I remember Googling things like being bitten, feeling like I was on another planet and being like, oh, that's a thing. Um, you know, this isn't just my situation. Reading things about like, you know, can this person be helped and seeing online that like that, that was not the experience that I was reading about. Um, also documenting can be very important. If you feel that you're in danger, I did a lot of documenting, which is why I was able to go to the police and be taken seriously. The judge in my case openly admitted that if I did not have all of this documented, he would not have believed me. Um, I recorded things, if you are able to do so safely, to journal the dates of when things happened and what what happened um, to make sure that you've told somebody, whether it's a best friend, just somebody that knows what's going on, uh, that will check in with you and make sure that you're okay. You don't know when these things can escalate. Uh, if you are ready to leave, to understand that that's not always something that is done at, at once. Uh, there can be planning involved. And there are many organizations in Montreal that can help with that type of planning um, to make sure that you will be safe, that you can get out safely. Um, you can speak with the police. There are many things that you can do, whether you feel comfortable or not speaking with the police is a personal choice, um, but certainly extricating yourself from the situation, telling people, finding support. There are people who will be supportive. There are people who, when they find out if you are comfortable telling people, you will be surprised at just how many people will tell you that they've been through the same thing. Your friends may be going through the same thing. Your Mom may have gone through the same thing. Your brother may have gone through the same thing. Um, there's a lot of power in finding allies. Um, and it does get better. You can get out. And these people are not as powerful as they want you to think they are. That's amazing. Yeah. Amy, we want to end it on kind of a positive note because both Booney and I believe that one person is not defined by one action. And there's so yeah. much more to Amy. So what... <laughs> What makes Amy happy these days? What What do you have going on? Who is Amy Kaufman? Uh, well, that's a multi-pronged question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, I now work for a nonprofit called Women Aware um, and do outreach to other survivors of conjugal violence. And that's great. And the people I work with are all survivors as well, which is really uplifting and amazing to see. Despite the unfortunate commonality, uh, what good company I'm often in. Um, I have a three-year-old who is amazing and it's been a wonderful thing, the only wonderful thing I guess to come from all of this, but he's a blast and just enjoying my life and freedom and feeling really lucky to be in a position of being able to be happy. And I didn't think you know, three years ago that I would be here now. So that's really exciting. It's amazing. And we can't thank you enough for joining us. Like I said, you, you are a true hero. Your words do will make a, a big impact. And as Booney said, it's it's hard to share this story, you know, and it's hard to listen to, but it's such an important thing. And 
like you said, one in three is just people who, who actually come forward. So the number is probably closer to one in two. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. So any closing words? Again, just to say thank you so much. It means the world to us for you to, you know, spare your time to talk to us both. And I know that many people will feel validated. Maybe they'll be, you know, questioning things and be curious and they can come and speak to us, like you said, at Champlain, or they can look for resources in the community, like, and for your organization as well, Women Aware, that's a good start. Um, SOS, Violence Conjugale, um, any kind of mental health uh, support service that you can find. I, I, I hope that you, if you're in this situation, will, you know, learn something from Amy's experience. And um, I, I think people will feel validated by what you've told us today, Amy. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for having me. We'll just leave it on this note because I have to thank your brother Dave and, and Mo uh, for setting this up. And Dave said, she is a professional who has done all North American national media. I'm extremely proud of her and what she is doing. And I love her with all my heart. Aw. He's a, a nice way to end it. Thank yeah. you, Amy. Thank you so much. Bye. Yeah.